times whenever I was working, we got people used to chasing bugs around here, you know. Uh-huh. Now you can actually cut wires and cut wires and cut wires, you know, until you've got everything so cut up that nothing works anymore. And I don't usually cut wires, but sometimes I do. Uh-huh. But one day, these this guy had a uh, that that Crown Victoria was skipping, and uh, he was looking on it. I said, "Find out why the Crown Victoria is skipping." And so he uh, worked on it for Michael Green is his name. He worked on it for half a day, and he was checking the injector and he was checking this and all that kind of stuff. And and I said, "What have you? What's your conclusion?" He said, "Well, I don't know what you did to this thing, but it's skipping on number two, and I can't figure out why." And I said, "Have you checked the compression?" He said, well, you didn't do anything to the compression. I said, well, check the compression. He checked the compression. It didn't have any. And he said, well, what did you do? I said, I didn't do nothing. It's got a problem. <laughs> but see, he was going at it like a bug. Now, that's one of the reasons that I don't plant as many bugs as I used to because if you start chasing a bug all the time, you're trying to outthink me instead of trying to find the problem. You see what I'm saying? And that's what you were doing. You were trying to outthink Adam when he planted and he actually was slick as a button he got up in that harness and cut a wire going to those lights so they go out and taped it back up and here you were trying you took a long time because you were thinking he unplugged something or he left something out or he put a bad bulb or he blew a fuse well actually he made a problem you know you know what I'm saying and I didn't have a problem with him doing that but it sure gave you a wake up call didn't it yeah you know what do you do you go to the place where the power originates and you check it there and then you go to the place where it's supposed to be going, and you check it there, and you see what connectors are in between there. You got me? No, or, you he know. did that, yeah. but I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have any idea. You say, well, what you got to do is you got to think, if I have power here, but I don't have power here, the problem's got to be somewhere in between here. Yeah. Now, something else that's interesting to find is a short circuit. When a wire is completely short in the ground, and somebody's run a screw through the harness whenever they were putting their running boards on there or something. You know what I'm saying? And I've seen that again and again and again and again and again. And so you're sitting here saying, okay, I've got a um, got a wire that's shorted the ground here somewhere on this circuit here. And so I will take me a circuit breaker, a little circuit breaker, you know, a little thing with the two screws on it that resets itself. Ding, 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 ding. You ever seen one? Let me show you one. No. This right here is a 12 volt 10 amp circuit breaker. All right, that is an industrial grade item and it's made for automotive use. And what it does, and you can get them for various different amperages. You know, you can get, I've, I've seen 8 amps, up, this is 10, you can get 20, and all that. I ordered these special. And so what you do with that is, I'm going to take this particular circuit breaker here, and I'm going to take some lugs right here. Got me? All right, I got two sets of lugs. I got wires coming off here, I got wires coming off there. Okay, now this is my circuit breaker, right? And that's this thing right here. Got it? Okay, right here, I'm going to put a light bulb. And that light bulb, and then I'm going to put this, you know where my blown fuse is? My blown fuse, you know the fuse you put in and it goes pop? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to take my blown fuse and I'm going to shove this down in there so that I'm in both sides of that blown fuse place. In, play, in place of the fuse, I'm putting the circuit breaker and the light. Now that short circuit... It's now going through the circuit breaker to ground. And the circuit breaker's going to go dink, dink. It almost acts like a turn signal flasher, but it ain't near as fast. All right, and so every time that circuit breaker opens up, this light's going to light up. Got me? All right, so now that I've got the circuit breaker in, it's going dink, 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 dink. Okay, I'm going to look around, and like if it's courtesy lights, you know, and you got the ones on your visor, and you got this one up here, and you got the ones in your doors, and all them lights that come on. All right, I'm going to look at all them lights. And I'm going to open up the visors and all that kind of stuff. And one of those lights, if there's a short leading to one of them, one of those lights is not going to come on. The rest of them will. In other words, I've got this one's coming on, that one's coming on, that one's coming on, this one's coming on, that one's coming on. I know that the legs feeding those are not short in the ground. The one that don't come on, the one feeding that one, it's where the short is. And on courtesy lights, you'll see that thing spider webbing all over the car. 
You know what I'm saying? If you got a short on that one, you got a lot of looking to do. Now, if any part of that circuit feeds a cigarette lighter, you better darn well be checking the lighter. Because the stupid cigarette lighter can be shorted and cause you to run all around up in the barn. Pull that stupid cigarette lighter out, look at it, and see if there's money in the cigarette lighter. You know, we've seen that before. Money in the cigarette lighter will blow a fuse or stuff like that. Okay, so on some of them that don't have a fuse feeding that cigarette lighter, like the little 92 Taurus, if a penny gets down in there, the darn thing will kill the battery overnight because of a penny in the cigarette lighter. You know what I'm saying? So learn how to look at those schematics. Learn how to track that kind of stuff down because if you don't, you will crash and burn in this business. But you need to be able to fix electrical stuff. And this engine performance stuff that we're getting ready to talk about, we're talking about fuels today, but it actually has a lot to do with finding harness shorts and stuff like that. Because a harness short can make a misfire because of the, you know going to the injector. Incidentally, you remember that uh, Crown Victoria that you worked on for that we for the skip that you and all. Uh, and you remember my number four was skipping, and then it quit skipping, and we put another coil in it. Well, when I f got to digging into that, when he came to pick it up, it was skipping on number four again, and the check engine light was on. And I found out that that uh, the wires going to that connector, feeding that injector, had rubbed into, and it was barely it was ten of in two and touching. <laughs> so I had to go find a pigtail. That wasn't anything you did, but it was something that you and me both missed. When we pull that injector, and we pull that, I mean, that coil, I'm talking about not the injector, the coil pack was being fed by wires that were rubbed into, and it was making the number four misfire come and go. See, and we disturbed it when we pulled it out and put it back in, and, and wires, there was enough of that insulation left where that copper was touching, mm -hmm. you know, and then we'd move, you'd move it and it'd go away. And so well, anyway, I had to, you know, fix that right quick the next day when it came out on Friday. Anyway, these things right here, you can get them. That is a, one of the handiest tools you'll ever have. And... That's kind of like one of these. Well, for engine performance purposes, you take a potentiometer like that one right there, and you take one that's like zero to 50,000 ohms, you can go to Radio Shack and you can buy them every day. They don't cost but a very a few, a couple of dollars. And if you take two wires, and you see you got a middle wire and you got two side wires. Okay, the only difference is if you hook to these two wires and you turn it, the resistance will go up. If you hook to these two wires and you turn it the same way, the resistance will go down. You got me? So basically, you're just going to pick two of the three, a middle one and one of the side ones, always a middle one of the side ones, and you can hook it up to an engine coolant temperature sensor, and you can watch your scan tool, and you can turn this knob, and you can change that reading. Okay, what, how, what good is that? Well, I'm going to say, I wonder if the stupid cooling fan will come on on this car, and you ain't got time to let the thing warm up for the fan to kick on. So I'm going to crank the car up, I'm going to unplug the engine coolant sensor, I'm going to hook these two wires right here, Coming off of this stupid thing, and I've done it with jumper wires, into the engine coolant sensor, and I, I watch my scan tool, and when I get that, I turn it real slow, and I get it up to the temperature where the fan is supposed to come on, the fan will kick on. And it's still cold here, but it thinks it's hot because you're manipulating the voltage with this potentiometer. Now, this is not made to carry current, and I was kind of silly trying to get it to carry current with that silly little uh, computer box fan there. And I turned that thing up. I was controlling that fan speed a while ago. So cool, me and Quincy. And this thing caught fire right here on the table. This flames coming out. <laughs> I wish I'd had that on film. That is, oh, I was really? like, <laughs> oh! <laughs> I mean, I thought it was going to burn the house down. So I took jerked it out there and threw it in the trash. Anyway. All right, let's get into this engine performance one test three. Um, Technician A says drivability problems may be avoided by using top tier gasoline. Technician B says drivability problems may be avoided by always keeping the fuel tank at least one quarter full. B. Both of those guys are right. I thought uh, a little top tier gasoline. Yeah, you? that's the best stuff. The best stuff that you can get, not the you know the crummy second rate, sorry, junky gasoline down that's cheap. You know. I know, but out of eighty-seven, yeah. that top tier. Eighty-seven. Not, you're not talking about octane. You're basically octane. You're basically talking about the blend of the fuel. You know what I mean? And so my question to this guy that wrote this is, uh, how do I know? You know what I'm saying? You know, I like to go to a, a name brand station if I can. Now, you know, all of us have got to stop every now and then at a station that we don't know to recognize a brand. But, uh, you know, if you buy something like Shell or Exxon or one of the really, you know, high grade, they're going to have better gas than you're going to have a lot of independent stations. See what I'm saying? If it's, if it's a name brand you ain't never heard of, you, ain't, you don't really know what you're putting in there. See what I'm saying? Uh, so the way that you can stay with your top tier gas is to go to a, a name brand station that you know sells a lot of gas nationwide because they're going to have good gas going around. But what is it, what's this business about one quarter full? 
Well, that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, it won't always burn up a fuel pump. I don't let GMC it will. If you let that GMC idle or runs out of gas, you are going to destroy the fuel pump. Say something about these new cars. If you if you let the gas tank get low, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll mess up the uh, fuel injection system or something. Yeah. Well, basically what you're going to look at there, there's a bunch of reasons for that. But what I always think about, and I don't even like one quarter full, the, uh, if you drive around on empty all the time, and this is something that he may not even be thinking about, what happens inside that tank on the walls of that tank? We have condensation, don't we? Yeah, and then it runs down in there and you got water. It ain't just rust because you got plastic gas tank, it ain't going to rust, you know, and all that kind of thing. But, you know, you don't want that water coming through there. But nowadays you're drawing the fuel right off the bottom of the tank through some little nibs. I mean, you know, and so you're actually processing the water a lot sooner than you used to when it was suspended this hour far off the bottom of the tank and you'd have a gallon in there moving in. Yeah, that's a diesel. Yeah. That is actually got, is that a six liter? Yeah. Yeah, that six liter, you got actual a hydro, or a horizontal fuel conditioning module on the inside of the frame down there and it's got a water and fuel sensor on it. There's a fuel pump in that thing, there's a filter in that thing, and there's a water and fuel, sen water and fuel sensor in that thing. And so yours is saying water and fuel now? Uh, well, a lot of the times that silly little thing, and uh, we can, you know, we ought to have a look at that for him, you know, because it ain't that complicated, you know what I'm saying? And that six liter can doggone sure it can uh, actually, if you even if your fuel pressure gets really low, those injectors can actually suck fuel up in there, and but it beats them up and it ruins the injectors if they got really low fuel pressure and all that. I could, boy, I could talk for three hours about a six liter. But uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, that's basically there's a sensor in that little horizontal fuel conditioning module on that six liter. What year is yours? Uh, 05. 05? All right. Uh, whatever. Technician A says, lower octane fuel in vehicles designed for premium fuel will cause serious engine damage. Technician B says, some octane boosters will cause discoloration of the porcelain on the spark plug. Who's right about that? Me, right. Okay. You're going to have, you're going to run into more trouble putting high octane fuel in a low octane vehicle than the other way around. Did you know that? If you put 93 octane in a vehicle that's designed to run on 87 octane, uh -huh. you can cause drivability problems, which makes it, you know, put, you know, pop and snort and backfire through the intake when it's cold and all that. And you know, it varies from vehicle to vehicle. But if it says it's supposed to have 87 octane, you're not doing yourself any favor by running premium in it. And there's technical service bulletins from Chrysler and Ford that I know about that says don't run premium fuel in there if it's in 87. You don't burn all the fuel. Premium fuel burns slower. Some of that stuff is going to stay in the combustion chamber. It's going to start to form carbon. As it starts to form carbon, it raises your, com your uh, compression ratio. It's taking up space in the combustion chamber. That carbon builds up. As it takes up space, it gets to where it pings and labor knocks and detonates when you're going. And because you've made a problem for yourself by putting that premium fuel in there. You see, premium fuel is a slower burning fuel. And if it's, this stuff is figured in nanoseconds, right? If your car calls for premium fuel, put premium fuel in it. If it don't call for premium fuel, put 87 in it. Whatever it calls for, that's what you need to squirt in the tank. But this one here says B is supposed to be the right answer. And this is the second joke. I was going to tell you, my brother had a Thunderbird one time. And he was driving. It had a, he had that, that great Thunderbird I used to have on a picture on the screen out here. It was a 71 Thunderbird. And it had a 429 in it with 375 horsepower. It was one of the... It was the engine that was built for the Mustang, and it was one of them high output engines. It was in that particular car. It was odd that that one year model had that, you know, high. And most of them didn't have that much horsepower. Well, his was running kind of crummy, and uh, he was. When we look at, it, I pull the plugs out, and they were, they on the porcelain, they looked real ugly and rusty, like red. Uh, it wasn't like water, but it was stained red. And they was popping and snorting and cutting out, and I put another set of spark plugs in it. It ran like a sewing machine. I said, where the heck did this come from? He said, well, for about the last three weeks or a month, I've been using octane booster. We pour octane booster in a gas tank. It actually can make some little deposits of crud on the porcelain. And, it, and I've seen on a Mustang that was similar to the one he drives that had a surge. All right, my buddy Donnie was working on it. I wrote an article about it. It, it would surge. And he actually, I say not him, you. I was thinking you were sitting over there because you and him remind me of one another. But uh, anyway, I pull this uh, EGR line off, you know, EGR valve, if it was surging like it's one of the feeling is. Now, nowadays, a lot of times it's a transmission oil breaking down, 
you know, causing the torque converter to chatter and stuff. Uh, but I pull that EGR valve off, and it stopped the surgeon. And so Donnie was working on replacing uh, DPFE sensors and, you know, worried about the solenoid maybe causing surge. And he did all that, and it was still surging. And he was beating his head against the wall. And I said, Donnie, don't you remember some of these 3.8s that we worked on would get valve stem seals on the spark plug. And they get a lot of that puffy ice cream looking crap in the bottom left spark plug you see up there. That's valve stem seal deposits. So what it is, right there, that bottom left spark plug. All right. You see that stuff there on there. If you get enough on there, you'll get a surge that will go away when you unplug these yard valves. I said, something's wrong with those spark plugs. So we pull the spark plugs out. And those spark plugs had so much of that octane booster crud. That guy had been running an octane booster in that Mustang because he wanted, thought he was doing it a favor. And he had a lot of that stuff on the porcelain, and it was jumping to the side. You could see where the arc had stopped jumping, and it was an easier path for it to follow the porcelain down and hit the side of the plug. Mm. And it wasn't giving him, you know, the, the spark was happening in the cylinder, but it's in the wrong place. And so you'd have random misfires while you were driving. That's what was giving you that surge, see. Anyway, we put plugs in it, told him to get that octane booster the heck out of there, and he had no more trouble, you see. So, figure on that. All right, so, let me see. Uh, now, B is the one, yeah. While we're still on the fuel thing, the other day while I was riding home with uh, my buddy, we stopped at the gas station on the other side of the bridge. Uh -huh. Non-ethanol gasoline. And I have a question, is that... Better gasoline to use? If it doesn't have ethanol, you'll get slightly better fuel economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I mean, that's it. And I do have an engine performance. You guys are going to get a worksheet. And I'm going to show you how you can ch test gasoline and see how much ethanol is in it. And you'd be surprised when you go to the ones, even the ones that say they have ethanol in them, you can check them. And a lot of the times they ain't got no ethanol in them. You know what I mean? Because they got a sticker on the pump that's just covering them, you know, so you'll know that we may have ethanol in here, you know, and it'll say it contains or it may contain, you know, this kind of stuff. Well, you can actually check it if you know how. It ain't hard to do. Uh, has anybody got a rain gauge at home? A rain gauge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about one of them little rain gauges that's got straight. I know you do, Mr. Farmer, <laughs> uh, but you got rain gauge over it. All right, you take a, t a tape measure and you mark it with 10 even graduations, right? Okay, then you're going to pour that thing 90 percent full you got to have 10 even graduations 90 percent full of gasoline that you're testing and then you're going to pour the other 10 percent full with water and that water is going to do what it's going to go to the bottom and it's going to sit there and it's going to be a separate you know, there's going to be a line you can see where the gas and the water come together because that's how gas and water do right okay if it's got alcohol in it that alcohol likes the water better than it does the gasoline so you put a cork on that and you shake it up, and you set it down, and however much water you gain is how much alcohol you got. See what I'm saying? If you gain another graduation of water, you've got 10% ethanol. So, if you so gain, alcohol is going to mix with the water. It's going to mix with, it's going to leave the gas and mix with the water because it likes the water better than it does that. And that's just easy as pie to check the gas. And all that. And the more ethanol they put in these things, like these people that work on lawnmowers, they have a booger every time when that stuff's got ethanol in it because they don't like the, you know, run right. Okay, but anyway, I one time had a little motor I was working on on a bench down there in Texas, and I took this thing and I, I said, I think I'm, I don't have any gas here. I think I'll just use some of this denatured alcohol to run off of it. And it didn't run, it ran lean. It was like, oh, you know, when you give it gas, it's like it didn't have enough. And so the alcohol, the point is, listen, if you're working on a drivability problem and it's giving you some fits because you can't figure out what's going on, what you need to do is recognize the fact that you need to test your fuel. And at the very least, if you can figure out a way to put a sample of really good, known good fuel through that thing under pressure, and there's ways you can do that if you're you know, a thinking man, uh, and it runs good on that. Here's an example. Uh, Mark Shipes is working on a Bronco. 92 Bronco, and when he cranks it up, it pops back when it's cold. Boop, boop, boop. It won't hardly run. And so he works on it. He cleans the injectors, and he sets the time in, and he does all kinds of crazy stuff on it. And he's just beating his head against the wall over there. And I try to stay out of his business usually, you know, unless he asks me a question. But now one day I says, Mark, I mean, while he was working on this that same day, I says, you need to go over and see what kind of gas they're burning. Because it sounds to me like it's got premium gas in it. 
And uh, I says, don't ask any leading questions. Just go up there other than to say what kind of gas are you using. And I said, I bet you they're going to tell you they're using premium gas. And so he goes up there to, you know, talk to them. And they said, oh, yeah, man, we're putting uh, 93 octane, best we can buy in there. And he worked on that thing all morning long because he had fuel that was causing him a problem. See, they thought they were doing themselves a favor. It ran fine when it was warm, ran bad. Well, I had one like that. And this is the, uh, there's a point to these stories. I'm not just trying to entertain you. This is something you need to think about. 89 Taurus comes in when the rental car places had 89 Tauruses before the dealership did, you know, because they buy so many from Ford. Okay, one comes in for this guy like, you know, six, 8,000 miles on or something like that. And when you crank that thing up cold, you'd have to really feather the gas to keep it alive. And if you, you know, didn't manage to keep it alive, it would foul the spark plug, you know. So you had to, you know, take the plugs out and clean them and whatever and put them back together, crank it up. You keep it running. And that son of a gun, when it would idle, a little bit of white smoke would come out in the tailpipe. And when you would drive it, after it finally got warmed up, that thing would run like a spotted ape. I mean, it would just absolutely fly. And I was like, good grief, what is up with this? You know, it's a brand new car. And the Stuart Sonnen was a guy that was a Ford instructor, an engineer. And he was down there walking around. He says, I said, Stuart, what do you think about this tar over here? I said, I've already gone through everything. There's nothing that I can see going on with the, you know, oxygen sensors and fuel controllers and like that. He says, check the compression on it. And Stuart had a tendency to stutter a little bit, you know. And so I screwed the compression gauge and I checked the compression. It's supposed to have about 160 pounds on the Taurus. That's what you expect to have because I checked a lot of them every day. That's where I was doing it. And I checked out and had 210 pounds of compression on every cylinder. What? No wonder the dog on thing runs so good. It's got more compression than it ought to have by about 25%. And I said, uh, this thing's got 210 pounds of compression. You know, and he was a forward engineer. And he goes, what? What? I said, yeah, that ain't right. Well, the shop foreman had a tendency to be sort of hard-headed, you know. And uh, I says, Philip, that thing has got 210 pounds of compression. He said, that don't make no difference. I said, doggone it, you're telling me it's got 50 pounds more compression on every cylinder than it's supposed to have, and that's not significant? I mean, come on, man. You know, well, he just really didn't know what to do with that. Well, you know what was wrong with that car? Somebody put a couple of gallons of diesel in it. Somebody, when they turned it in at the rental place, I don't know how they managed to make it happen because that diesel nozzle's bigger, but they put some diesel in it. And the way we found it was, I got some of the fuel, you know, I got a sample from the fuel straighter port on my hand, and I waved it around. And after I waved it around and the gas should have already dried off, I smelled diesel. The diesel doesn't evaporate like the gas does. Mm -hmm. So I unhooked the fuel lines from it. I got my injector cleaning machine and hooked it up, and I dialed the pressure into where it was supposed to be with good, fresh, clean gas, and it ran like brand new. Well, I told that story in here one day. Yeah. And David Buck, he had to go put a bunch of diesel in his little pickup see if it'd run better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't get the mix right just guessing at it. You know what I mean? He might could do something with that if he figured out exactly what the mix was, but whoever that was landed right on it. And a, few, a couple of days later, somebody was saying, this thing starts and runs terrible when it's cold, but it runs good when it's hot. And I says, check it for diesel in the gas. And they did, and sure enough, that pickup had diesel in the gas. They thought I was a hero. Mm -hmm. After I busted my fanny and paid my dues on that one. <laughs> All right, so now then, here we go. Which of these is not a possible effect of using gasoline with alcohol additives? A, increased octane. B, increased volatility. Th C, reduced CO emissions. D, all of these can result from using uh, alcohol additives. What do you think? That's D. If regular grade gasoline is used in an engine designed for premium gasoline, what might result? Reduced. You may have reduced fuel economy or you have reduced engine power if it's designed for premium gas. Okay, that's the whole point. Uh, adding up to 10% ethanol in gasoline can also increase the, the fuels. A, air fuel ratio, B, temperature, C, color, or D, volatility. Okay. D is actually volatile. Yep, yep. It actually it lights off a little easier. Reformulate it, but there's not as much energy in alcohol as there is in gasoline. Remember that. Okay. Um, did you know that a cup of gasoline's got as much explosive power as a stick of dynamite? A coffee cup full of gasoline? Yeah. So what I'm saying. And so why do they send the automotive people to the automotive department that are, you know, problem children? You know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about here, but some of the schools they do. Hello? Hey. Just fine, Debbie. How you doing? I sure do. What's up? All right. 
Hey, Ricky, talk to me, buddy. Yep. 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 Let's look at that because that radiator's got a lifetime guarantee. We need to do a pressure test on it if you can get it over here if he'll let you bring it. And we'll have a look at that and see if we can figure out what's going on. And I got I got the other key to your PT Cruiser in there on my desk that's been in there. And uh, All right. Yeah. Probably, but I'd let Debbie write it up just because, or you. Just y'all just go ahead and write it up for him. And all, if there is a radiator needs to be replaced, I got guys that just love to do that here, and it's got a lifetime guarantee. We put one in it last time it was in here, so so bring it on in here and uh, let me finish this lecture I'm giving right now, and I'll uh, we'll we'll have it. All right. Uh, to today's uh, yeah, just bring it either day, and you know we'll have to work it in, but we'll make it happen. All right. Appreciate it. Okay, sorry about that, fellas. All right, now then, um, let me see. Reformulated gasoline contains at least how much oxygen by weight? Um, I don't know how to do oxygen <laughs> by weight. <laughs> Two. Uh, how would you measure that, okay? Which of these symptoms may be caused by excessive ethanol in the fuel? Uh, rough idle or stalling. I'm going to tell you, that little test I gave you just a minute ago is how you tell. If you've got a problem, Randy Wilson over at the Cadillac store told me that sometimes they'll check them over there. People have put E85 in them. You know that E85 is 85 percent alcohol, and they'll say they'll have one running really trashy. And when they check the gas, it's got like 70 percent alcohol in it because somebody thought they'll save some money. Just squirt some of that in there and see how it does. <laughs> it don't run right, and they won't tell them when they take it in. You know what I mean? I've had people do that. They say. Uh, I said, this gas stinks. It smells like rotten gas. There's no wonder it's running bad. If you can get rotten enough where it won't even start, you know. And they said, well, I put some good gas in there with it. I said, how much good milk can you put in a gallon of sour milk to make it taste right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's the same thing, man. You got bad stuff there. Okay. All right, got to restart my camera here. All right, now then. Uh, air fuel ratio is described as what? A, the proportion of air to fuel by weight needed for a gasoline to run. Engine to run, the proportion of air to fuel by volume needed for it to run, uh, either A or B, neither A or B. C. B, volume? B. Oh, goodness, you got 9,000 gallons of air, you got one gallon of fuel. How do you do that? Anytime engineers work with gasoline they, or any kind of fuel, they always use weight as their basis for measure. On air. Huh? Yeah, on air you do too. 14.7 to 1 is your, that is your air fuel ratio by weight. 14.7 parts of air to one part of fuel. Yeah, that's stoichiometric mix for, you know, you heard it in emissions and, and all we were in there. Okay, 14.7 to 1 is the air fuel ratio that's the cleanest burning uh, with the fuel we got right now. Um, oxygenated fuel reduces CO in the exhaust by doing what? B, adding oxygen to CO to help form CO2. That's what an oxygenated fuel is all about, guys. You want to add another molecule of oxygen to it in case it's running a little bit rich. Now we're going to hit you with a couple of true falsies here. You got that? Right. Wait, what was nine? Huh? Wait a minute. Which one were we at? Nine. Oh, that's A. Is it weight? Yeah, air fuel ratio is by weight, not volume. Uh, oxygenated fuel is going to be, that's going to be B. I've got to hurry through with this. We're taking too much time. Okay, um, that was number, always fill gasoline cans on the ground to prevent static electricity. Is that right? Sure. You ever have a, you ever have a can of uh, a gasoline can in your pickup bed and fill it like that? Yeah, every time. But yeah. I don't want to pick it up. Yeah. Well, the, the reason you shouldn't do that is it could catch fire to you. And there's a guy out there at the, uh, there was a guy at the big little store on Park Avenue one time several years ago, got up in his truck, and when he went to put that gas in there, there was a static spark, and he went up in flames right there. I mean, it didn't burn him all that bad because somebody put it out, you know, but, you know, set it on the ground. You, know. you heard about the person burn up 
using their cell phone around the gas can? Right, I mean, while they were filling up the gas can? Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I heard, I heard somebody say that, I know Mythbusters tried to start a fire that way and couldn't. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So when they went to touch it, then it. Yeah, that's about right. I wouldn't surprise. It wouldn't surprise me. And you need to be. You need to sit in the car while you're gassing up. That's a bad idea. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that static electricity. What I tell you, eight to twenty-five thousand volts. Yeah. That'll knock a tar out of you. You ever had that? You ever take something? Pop. Get you yeah. on a cold, dry day. You never had that. All right, that's it. He's a Teflon man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, they zap you, you know. i tell you what, that man, his wife was both having trouble in the summertime. It wasn't even cold. They said, I get out of here, this thing shocks me. And so I got out, and it didn't shock me. I said, I'll tell you what, let me hold on the door, and you get out and touch me. So he got on the door, and when he touched me, it felt like I'd been hit by a coil wire. Pop! Good grief, what was that? You know? <laughs> so I didn't know why I was doing it, but I so said, you can ground the car by dragging some straps like some of the homeboys do. Or you can actually take some uh, static spray, like you use, you know, on clothes, and spray it on your seats, and it'll stop that. It'll really help you out. Have you think about that? All right. So a graduated cylinder, a small open flame, can be used to test for <laughs> alcohol content in gasoline. No. Uh, you don't use an open flame to test for anything in gasoline. Number 12, liquid fried petroleum gas is also called what? Yeah, <laughs> Liquif- liquefied, not liquid fried. Liquefied, that's number 12. What is it, guys? That's D, isn't it? Mm-hmm. LPG, propane. How much compressed natural gas does it require to achieve the energy of one gallon of gasoline? And we're measuring in cubic feet. What do you got? 122 cubic feet. Remember that because it's going to be on next week's pop quiz. When refueling a compressed natural gas vehicle, why is it recommended that the tank be filled to a high pressure? Uh, let's see. The range of the vehicle is increased. That is a duh answer, okay? Producing liquid fuel from coal or natural gas it uses which process? Fisher trucks. Okay, there are some people out there working on uh, producing uh, gasoline from air. What? Yeah, they just take air, atmosphere. And you reverse process it, and you can turn it back into gasoline. It's kind of expensive right now, but it's doable. You know, you're not really using a fossil fuel; you're just making gasoline out of atmosphere. That's weird. I ain't making this up. This ain't a joke. We don't have problems. Yeah, I don't know. Technician A says the stoichiometric ratio for gasoline is about nine to one. Bah humbug. Technician B says the stoichiometric ratio for ethanol is about nine to one. Who's correct about that? B. B is correct about that. Using an ethanol enhanced or reformulated gasoline can result in reduced fuel economy. What you were asking me a while ago, and the answer is what? Uh, yeah. Yes, true. Uh, if you put yeah, you may or may not get the question right. Okay. Yep. Uh, of the alternative fuels listed in the text, which has the highest octane? How about A, compressed natural gas technician? A says vehicles capable of using 100% ethanol are known as flex fuel vehicles. Okay, let me ask you this. When is the last time you worked on a flex fuel vehicle in this shop? That, uh, that, that, it's something that we got our that pulled up. Remember the one that wasn't running? Which they one? Were, the one that Gene towed back. That one was flex fuel. Was it the GMC? Huh? The one that Gene towed back, which one? Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Floor. That's smart. That was a flex fuel vehicle. He knew he he, he was checking it. You you put it in all that. Uh, the serial number told you it was flex fuel. That Yeah, uh, uh, that Explorer that they you know had the balancer that came apart and they drug it and let Uncle oh, Joe put it here. Well, which one was it? Yeah, uh, we've one got one two. The we've got two that, that are flex Dodge fuel. Stratus. Huh? Flex fuel. That's him. Listen to that guy. Dodge Stratus. Dodge Stratus. And which other one? The Dodge Caravan. The Jimmy Hutto drives is a flex fuel vehicle. Now, they ain't got no badges on them. You can't look at them and tell, but the serial number will tell you if you know which digit to look at. You know? So, I mean, it'll tell you. Uh, and, the, and the eighth digit, basically, the engine is what tells you. Now, why is having a flex fuel vehicle, if you were going to buy one, if you had a choice, and you had two vehicles identical, and one was flex fuel and one was not, would you be wise to buy the flex fuel vehicle, and if so, why? Yeah, Stronger, yeah. The fuel injectors are made out of stainless steel, and the 
the fuel lines and the fuel tank is better and the fuel pump is better and everything's better because alcohol is corrosive and they have to make it into a higher standard to handle that alcohol. You got it? Just keep that in mind. Uh, it's not the kiss of death to have a flex fuel vehicle, you know? Good stuff. All right. Um, let's see. Wait, two questions on the flex fuel vehicle. All right. So that is, like, the Tech A was 100% true? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we went. I lost my tra I lost my place here. About, uh, flex fuel a minute. Oh, well, which question were we on? I'm a goofy. 19. Oh, yeah, that's one of the water. I couldn't see that. Technician B says these vehicles are unable to achieve 100 horsepower. <laughs> yeah, that's D. Yeah, not 100% ethanol. How much ethanol is in a flex fuel vehicle? 85%. A vehicle burning compressed natural gas loses about how much power compared to gasoline? A. 10%. Stoichiometric ration for <laughs> ratio should be for compressed natural gas is Z. Actually, that is a. what do you think? Number. I'm saying Z, but you gonna say A, right? I'm gonna say A is what I'm gonna say. Technician, an engine designed to burn CNG <coughs> may include what design modifications? Now this is the engine itself now. Increased compression ratio, and that's gonna. They're doing that to try to help it have a little more power. Flex fuel vehicle has enhanced fuel system components that include all of these except what? B. B. Yeah, low temperature resistant overheat. <laughs> it's getting too cold or whatever. And that's B. B is the answer to that one. Okay, now let's flip on through the rest of these. 24 uh, is the next one. A flex fuel vehicle uses the PCM to make adjustments to the engine according to the percentage of ethanol in the fuel. The PCM must adjust which engine settings? Uh, Ignition time and quantity of fuel, both A and B. Methanol fuel vehicle uh, exhaust contains what? Let's look at these answers. A, naugahyde, B, endoline, C, formaldehyde, or D, iodine? D. It's actually going to be C, formaldehyde. <laughs> well, you know, that's a derivative of alcohol, formaldehyde is. But naugahyde is not. You know what naugahyde is? Anybody know what naugahyde is? You know what naugahyde is? Mr. I wish I was born in the 70s, he probably knows because everything was naugahyde. You see that cloth you got your hand on? That's naugahyde. I mean that black thing on the table, this stuff, you know, stuff that looks sort of like leather, they call that naugahyde. And the place they get it is they kill these little naga animals that they find in the, <laughs> not really, <laughs> it's actually <laughs> synthetic. All right, uh, methanol used for fuel can be what? Definitely not A. It's toxic. And they basically make it poisonous so you won't drink it. You know what was the, uh, the Soviet fighter pilots drink the fuel for their jets because they burn alcohol. <laughs> they don't make that poisonous, so whenever they ain't got nothing to do, they just drink some jet fuel and get drunk, I guess. <laughs> you know, I read about that whenever I was reading about that guy that uh, defected in 1975 with his MiG-25 Fox bat. You know, he drank that stuff. Wear a short sleeve shirt when working with fuel so any spills can be easily washed off. <laughs> That's actually false, although if you get gasoline, on your, have you got like gasoline on your clothes? Yeah. And it yeah. kind of starts to sting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you got really tender skin, you may turn into a whiny baby because you feel you feel like you're about to die. Like if you spill it on your pants or something, and it gets on your leg, and you know one of your tender part of your leg, man, it'll feel like it's on fire for a little while. You got to get that thing off. You know, of course, you're basically it's basically best not to splatter a lot of it on there. Uh, although, how many of us wash parts in gasoline for years? You know, we use. Uh, water-based solvent. Now, methanol is also called what? All of the above. All of the above. Wood alcohol, methyl hydrate, methyl alcohol. Which alcohol is toxic? <laughs> A, methanol. Which is the most widely used alternative fuel? Mm -hmm. Propane. 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 Did you know that, you know these big propane trucks that they uh, deliver gas to your house with? Mm -hmm. You know, if you got gas heat. They they run the truck off of the propane. They ain't got no regular gas tank on there. I mean they don't know they they didn't, and then what's got to me is they just leave the regular fuel injector plugged in and they just let them click away. Mm -hmm. All right, we got company. Yeah, young fellow.
Hi. Come on in here, buddy. Just have a seat. This is my grandson. Come Your on. grandson? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is Andrew. Have a seat, Andrew. We're almost finished with this here thing right here. All right. And, um, all right. Andrew's come to have a look at his car because he got a check engine light. Are you feeling it skip? Um, no. Not feeling it skip. You just got a check engine light. Okay. He drove up here from Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So uh, let me see. Where were we at? I lost my place. 31. The higher the cetane rating, what? Cetane rating, and what are we talking about? We're talking about cetane. That's diesel, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, and what did I tell you what cetane was? Hey. He say, 31? A. That's A, he's right. Now, what is cetane? Somebody tell me what cetane is. I told you last week. Okay. Huh? Okay. Now, basically, you remember cetane is a colorless liquid that has perfect combustion properties, and they compare the diesel fuel to the cetane in a percentage. And most diesel fuels like 40, 45, 50 cetane. It only, I mean, you know, as far as the cetane rating, it burns about half as good as cetane. So t cetane is the, what was that word I was giving you this morning? Do you remember? Benchmark. Baseline. Benchmark. That is the place where it starts, and they're going to compare other things to it. You got me? So diesel's compared to cetane. Cetane's at 100. They rate it as 100, and how it compares to that is how they determine what cetane is. Most people do not know that. Even diesel engine mechanics, if you ask them, most of them don't know that because they don't really need to. You know what I'm saying? It's a, yeah, it's a, the cetane is a hundred, benchmark of 100. The API gravity of number two diesel fuel should be about what? 35. 35. That's smart. Where would you get that? You told me this whenever we were doing the diesel on, uh, I don't remember if it was last semester or earlier this one. Okay. Technician A says that diesel fuel has more heat energy than gasoline. Technician B says grade number two is the grade recommended by, for normal service in automotive diesel engines. Which technician is correct? Both of them. When I was working on those power stroke diesels, if they pulled in there with a problem, and I took that top, top of that fuel filter, and that diesel fuel was red, I would put it back together and I'd drive it outside and I'd say, bring that thing back after you run three regular tanks of good fuel through it. You don't bring that thing in here with off-road diesel in there because it gels up, it's got sulfur in it. It is not, it's, but a lot of people say, you know, the ambulance drivers, because they, the guy, the, the county commissioner can actually sign away that waiver so that, you know, it's like a tax-free thing. You know, that's the first time I actually understood it. What's that? Off-road diesel is red. Man. Yeah. And it's a, they dye it red so you won't be using it, or you're not supposed to. It's so untaxed. You put in your car, is what, yellow is on? Yeah, it's a yellow diesel. It's okay. sort of that yellowish color. But you see red diesel fuel, somebody putting the wrong stuff in there, and it causes trouble. And on these, these diesels nowadays, everything's measured in nano whatever anyway. Uh, let's see. Uh, specific. Now, you, what I tell you about the difference between a gas and diesel? With a gas engine, you're slapping the crankshaft. With a diesel engine, you're pumping it. That's why you got so much more torque with a diesel. Specifications for diesel include pour point, flash point, cloud point. All of, all of the above. Ultra low sulfur diesel fuel has a maximum of how many parts per million of sulfur? Uh, 15. 15 parts per million. Joe really seems to have read that chapter or something. Um, Mr. Lundy will be back on Monday. Lundy will be back on Monday. I could make a rhyme out of that. Uh, he actually was, I was only on the uh, Facebook chat with him. Huh? What? Okay. Okay, so when you come back.